Good morning. My name is Michael Amagna and I want to welcome you to TCLC's webinar, Our Special Obligation, Library Assessment, Learning Analytics, and Intellectual Freedom. TCLC is known for its excellent professional development programming and through an LSTA grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services as administered by the Pennsylvania Department of Education through the Office of Commonwealth Libraries and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf Governor, TCLC is now able to offer additional professional development opportunities online through webinars like this one today. As part of this grant funding, attendance of this webinar is free today. In addition, webinar, this webinar is being recorded and will be available through TCLC's YouTube channel in the near future for your viewing pleasure. Once the recording is available, a message will be sent out to the TCLC listserv to notify you of its availability. Our webinar today is being offered by Sarah Hartman Caverly. Sarah is an assistant professor and reference librarian at Delaware County Community College, where she liaises with the health science programs. For the past two years, her scholarship has focused intensively on learning analytics and the, and the intellectual freedom implications of big data in higher education. She's earned her MSLIS and MS in Information Systems from Drexel University and is celebrating her 10th year of working in academic libraries, which she can hardly believe. With that said, I'd like to turn things over to Sarah. Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you also to TCLC for this soapbox. You might come to regret it. Um, and so before we get too far into the agenda today, I do feel the need to, to post this obligatory disclaimer that the opinions I'm going to express are my own along alone. Uh, TCLC doesn't necessarily share them. My colleagues in my library don't necessarily share them, nor do my parent institution or employer, previous employers, or other affiliates, except, of course, where I've cited them. Um, and I also felt the need, uh, because we're going to get into some dark and heavy topics today, to sort of open this up with a bit of a joke. As Michael read, I have been investigating these issues in a scholarly capacity for about two years, and so I often jokingly say I'm in the rabbit hole of, of intellectual freedom and of surveillance related issues um, and so I found this uh, copyright free image through Flickr and later realized that there's a number of references I could make to Alice in Wonderland that would be appropriate to this discussion and so I brought them in as sort of an element of levity throughout the session you'll be seeing those. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is that uh, this talk is in the spirit of collegial critique and critical scholarship. Um, I'm going to be questioning some underlying premises that we might be taking for granted in our approach to library assessment. But again, these are by no means consensus views or mainstream views. So now on your screen, you should be seeing a concept map of the sort of intellectual terrain that we're going to try to cover. And if anybody was able to attend either in person or online, Carrie Gardner's presentation last week for iLead on privacy and confidentiality, we're essentially going to be picking up where Carrie left off. And before we again get into the meat of the conversation, I'd like to know what everyone is thinking with respect to intellectual freedom who's attending uh, the session today. So over the question and answer chat, you can uh, respond in free text in a sort of a brief explanation. What's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the phrase intellectual freedom means? And I'm gonna pause and let Michael feed me some of the responses from the Q&A chat. So what does intellectual freedom mean to you? The ability to pursue interest without restraint is what's coming through. Great. That's a great place for us to start. Uh, we're going to be unpacking this definition as we go throughout the session today. If I were forced to respond to this prompt, I would say intellectual freedom means the right to nonconformity. So that's one of the other themes that you can expect to see throughout the session today. 
I felt that this conversation required a bit of foregrounding. And one of the questions I've been asking myself for the past two years is, does this debate, this conversation even matter? So if you've been paying attention to uh, the WikiLeaks, either the original disclosures from Edward Snowden back in 2013 about the NSA, or the more recent disclosures in the past few weeks about the CIA with their Vault 7 initiative, um, you may have come to some agreement with Julian Assange, who a couple of years ago said, the game for privacy is over. We need to live, learn to live without it. Um, so the Pandora's box of big data and the surveillance that it enables is certainly open, but we're now starting to see some resistance, uh, some new attention to sort of human-centered and human-curated services. And so on your screen, you've got the logo for Pandora Radio, where I do have an account that takes advantage of web analytics to customize my music streaming. Um, but I'm also a member of our local Philadelphia area member-supported music station, and one of their recent advertising slogans is Rhythm not algorithms. They also use curated, not encoded. And so we see that there's still a debate about big data and algorithms and privacy and their role in our lives. Also, obviously, within our own discipline, we see initiatives like Choose Privacy Week coming up at the beginning of May, as well as the Independent Library Freedom Project with our, our worth some attention. So again, there's still a conversation to be had about privacy and, and its role in our lives. Likewise, I'm going to be throwing around the weighty term ethics and ethical. So I thought it was important to let you know what do I mean by ethical. And I actually borrow a definition from Otto Leopold, the naturalist and environmental ethicist, who said an ethic, ecologically speaking, is a limitation on freedom of action in the struggle for existence. And I find this definition compelling for two reasons. One is that it acknowledges that we do face existential threats, right? And we're going to talk more about those in just a second. But two, within the context of those existential threats, we still need to make some decisions about how we're going to behave. And in my mind, even in light of the existential threats that libraries and academic libraries face, there are going to be some data collection practices for the purposes of assessment, which will either be off the table completely or subject to conditions to preserve uh, that uh, ethics within that approach to patron data collection. So again, I think it's important to acknowledge where our current assessment practices come from, and they are in fact a response to some existential threats that we face. Uh, so going back to sort of the, the late 90s, early 2000s, libraries and academic libraries had just adapted to the disruption of the disintermediation uh, of our services by new technologies. In some cases, we did that by merging with IT departments on campuses, which I think is sort of an interesting uh, point of note. So right after we successfully navigate that adaptation, we've got the 2008 financial crisis. And of course, now we're facing uh, increasing budget crises, crises on our campuses, leading to library staffing cuts, library budget cuts, and library space cuts. So a retreat in the physical plant, the presence of the library on campus. The other thing that's documented in this time by this series of books called Academic Capitalism, that first edition came out in 1999. I've personally read the edition that came out in 2009, and there's a new edition that came out in 2014. Um, if you're interested in this history of sort of the corporatization of higher education, I think Sheila Slaughter and her colleagues laid out really nicely here. They go into some of the history of bureaucratization, new methods of assessment and forms of accountability, and how those then drive resource allocation on our campuses. And of course, with Within our own discipline, we see the same discussion playing out. So it was in 2009 the ACRL put out this memo, which is linked there for you, that said ROI, research on the use of ROI to assess libraries is limited, but we're borrowing this concept of assessment from management accounting. And it was out of that memo that we got the value of academic and research libraries initiatives, the VAL initiative from ACRL. It was from VAL that we got Dr. Megan Oakleaf's uh, impact starter kit for measuring academic library value. And then when, within a few years, we have ACRL running this three-part webinar series about learning analytics and optimizing the use of student data 
and library data on our campuses. So that's a bit of the intellectual backgrounding for the conversation that we're having now. And it gets even more interesting when we consider that there are now hybrid library science and MBA degrees, and even uh, what's being billed as a 21st century library science degree from uh, University of Southern California Marshall School of Business, which they called the nation's only library science degree program to be offered through a leading school of business. So this represents a real cultural shift within our profession that we're going to be talking about throughout the session today. Here's an example of one of the activities in the Impact Starter Kit that again was produced by Megan Oakleaf in response to that call from ACRL. Uh, this is the act from activity number 24, excerpts from that, to assess or not to assess. And what she models in this activity is the conversation happening within libraries around the issue of assessment. One of the sort of, uh, so I'm an ant assessment resistor, right? And one of the things that she says people like me will say is, we can't get access to the data we need um, because using data on individuals is unethical. And her suggested response is that assessment is a professional ethic and that we need to be guided by concepts of reflective practice and continuous improvement. Um, so we're going to be looking at our professional ethics with respect to how we handle patron privacy and how we handle assessment and ongoing improvement. Um, there's also sort of a, an assessment resistor line that said we already do a bunch of surveys and collect a ton of data, why do more? And Dr. Megan LaFleet goes on to say the most meaningful data is often the challenging to gather. There's no point in collecting easy but meaningless data and not having the right data is not an excuse for not collecting it. Um, I happen to agree with her, and one of the things that I want to point out is maybe that harder to reach data is the qualitative data that has more meaning. The easy to reach low hanging fruit is the clickstream data that we're now currently collecting, and it's that quantitative assessment approach that we now currently see in libraries. So we'll sort of scratch the surface a little deeper here to start talking about learning analytics and bring them into the conversation. So in the top left of your screen, you should be seeing a very high level definition of learning analytics. We are talking about web scale or cloud-based analytics, looking at learner profiling, so profiling our students. Um, some of the basic data sources feeding these learning analytic systems include our students' demographic data, their activity data, which again is all of their clickstream data in their use of our online learning management systems, their use of the library, and their use of any other networked campus services. Their achievement data, so their grades, their GPA, their credential completion, and also what they're now calling engagement data or attachment data. And in a lot of institutions, this is being gathered through the required use of student IDs to access a variety of services and is even extending out to collecting uh, data about the use of student IDs, for example, to get discounts at local restaurants. Um, so really looking at what kind of data can we capture about students and their affiliate or engagements with our campuses as a proxy for or a predictor of retention and re, retention I'm sorry and credential completion one of the strategies that came out of that ACRL three-part series last year on learning analytics was this idea that we also as libraries have identifiable patron data which we're collecting and which we can match or in the terms of the NSA the National Security Agency partner with other identifiable institutional data to quantify correlations between library use and desirable institutional outcomes so that's really been the hook can we validate the role of the library in uh, achieving certain institutional metrics and goals by matching, combining, or partnering the data we have about our students as our patrons and the other sort of demographic activity, achievement, and engagement data that our institutions are collecting. So now we need to go back and remember and think about some of the implications of capturing student data and also putting it in the cloud. And so I'm going to turn to Dana Boyd's technical properties of web data that she lays out in her 2008 dissertation. So she points out that data held in the cloud or data held on the web is persistent, meaning it's always going to be there, it's there forever. It's scalable, meaning that it can continue to accumulate longitudinally. And so for those of us who are familiar with concepts like Moore's Law, there's a lot of people now saying basically Moore's Law is broken. We're violating it because the cost to increase our data storage capacity is um, so far uh, below the capabilities right, of, of that data storage. 
It's also very searchable, which again allows us to partner data in the cloud in, in from one repository and match it up using identifiers with um, other points of interest in other uh, data sets. And it's replicable. It can be copied. So that means it can be packaged up and sold. So these are some of the aspects of our patrons data that we may be collecting and storing in the cloud that we need to be mindful of. Um, and that slide that you're seeing on the right hand side of the screen is again from that cache that was um, either whistleblown or leaked depending on your politics, right, by Edward Snowden, which again gives us a sense of what our intelligence agency's collection posture is. And you'll start to see some of these ideas about collecting everything, processing everything, partnering or matching everything come about in some of the recommendations for library assessment. The other question in my mind as I've investigated learning analytics and the development of this software is, you know, who is really benefiting? Koi Bono. And some of the analysis we're not now seeing from market forecasters is that this is in fact a $2 billion or $2,000 million, right? Um, so we call them billions, um, $2 billion uh, industry across the world. And that some of that value is in the development and uh, implementation of the software, but I'll also draw your attention to midway through this paragraph where they're deriving and generating revenue from content analytics. So if you are still having the metadata versus content debate, uh, I want to let you know that content is being collected through these ana learning analytic systems. Uh, Turnitin is a great example of where we see content analysis commodified for the purpose of assigning originality scores to students' papers. We could easily see content analytics looking at the subject matter or, right, or the topics that our students are exploring. And again, you know, is this $2 billion in, in venture capital and other value, is this uh, $2 billion worth of altruism? Or, you know, in what ways do investors in this field and develop developers in this field really expect to benefit? The other question that played out in my mind as I was exploring learning analytics is, well, where do FERPA and things like the Common Rule or, uh, you know, Institutional Research Board's IRBs, where do they come out in all of this? And I was surprised to find that there's actually massive loopholes in both of these privacy frameworks that allow for this kind of data collection and analysis to happen. In fact, perhaps even incentivize this kind of data collection. So with FERPA, um, we can see that educational records may be maintained by parties acting for or as agents of our institutions. Um, there is some guidance from the FPCO that says that this includes library records. But all of that data can be disclosed without student consent to other contractors, consultants, volunteers, other parties to whom the institution has outsourced services, including, for example, our online learning, learning management systems and any kind of institutional assessment. We also know that there's certain data called directory information, which includes things like a student ID, uh, birth dates, home address, full name, um, that may be disclosed without proactive consent from the student unless they opt out. On the right side of your screen, you see some information about IRB. Um, there's one way in which sort of our uh, assessment practices are sort of exempt from the common rule in that they're not necessarily research. So we don't necessarily think of these as sustained systematic investigations for the production of generalizable knowledge. Um, we also are exempted under a provision that says research done to assess educational practices or tools is exempt. And then later on, uh, in the uh, common rule, it says research involving the collection of pre-existing data, so data which maybe was originally collected for institutional assessment and now just kind of exists, can be used for research if it's been de-identified. Um, so again, some interesting loopholes that I think, you know, maybe if we think we're, we're ethical or protected by FERPA or we're protected by the common rule, um, it leaves a lot, for me at least, as a privacy professional, to be desired. So now we're going to look more at this sort of deliberate uh, linking or connection between library assessment and learning analytics. So in 2014 um, was one of the earliest references I can find through ACRL and through library organizations looking at learning analytics. It was written by Dr. Stephen Bell for the Keeping Up series. 
and he identified again that learning analytics has its origins in business and industry with consumer profiling and predicting of purchasing behaviors and goes on to say then that we might discover that students because they've been exposed to this kind of data capture through their public uh, K-12 to school experience are adjusted to this kind of profiling and predictive analysis. Um, he also talked about learning analytics in the spring program for TCLC um, back in 2016 and if you were sitting at the same table with me then you were actually a sounding board for some of the ideas that I'm putting forward in this presentation, maybe unwittingly. What's interesting about um, Dr. Bell's assertion that students are going to be um, well adjusted to this idea is that we're now getting some data just a few years later from the Open University in the UK, which has really been one of the leaders of the learning analytics movement, saying that even when students are consulted in decision making processes regarding educational data mining, when they go back and actually look at the click through data, the click stream data that's collected about them, some of the students are still horrified by it. So even when they have a very high level of awareness of what's going on, in retrospect, they still have some regrets, right, about participating. And so I think privacy norms are something that we want to be careful about making assumptions about and that we're also uh, professionally responsible for cultivating. So that's one of the things that we'll, we'll talk about. Finally, I want to turn to this very influential article. Um, I've been sort of in my mind referring to this as the Minnesota model, but you've probably seen this article published in Portal. Um, it's still number eight out of 10 frequently downloaded articles from that publication as of February. It was cited 14 times in Lista, 105 times in Google Scholar, and it's featured in the ACRL Value of Academic Libraries promotional poster. So it's a really influential study on using library data and linking it up with other institutional data to demonstrate correlation uh, between library use and student success. So one of the lines that I found very arresting in this study was this idea that privacy concerns are valid, but data can be gathered, stored, and aggregated without compromising individual privacy. Um, so I see the sentence, and as a librarian, I see that there's no citation here, which means that they're either putting this forward as common knowledge, which I don't think that it is, or they're putting it forward you know, as an opinion, which then is eligible for some um, good faith scholarly critique. So my question is really, you know, what was going through the mind of the authors and of the peer reviewers when they put forward this assertion without any uh, kind of citation? Really interestingly, further on in the same paragraph, their recommendation to libraries is to put infrastructure in place as soon as possible to gather data, even if you're not really ready yet to analyze that data or you have uh, no specific purpose for collecting that data. Um, so I want to point out that this now is in opposition to some of the standards and best practices that we're seeing from large scale web analytics and data analytics professionals who are now promoting this idea of data minimization, that you limit the collection of personal information to that which is absolutely necessary to accomplish a specific known purpose. And that data minimization as a practice uh, protects us against data hoarding, uh, which is a real phenomenon that people are talking about, and which leads to actually an inability or a compromised ability to derive meaning and interpret data because there's just so much data and so much noise. We also need to understand that collecting student data is to some extent a liability. So data minimization helps us with managing the risk of maintaining all of this patron data. And it's also simply a cost control mechanism. So even though we said, you know, Moore's Law is now a little bit defunct or outdated, there's still a cost to maintaining all of this data. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out with this article is some of their findings, all of their findings are correlational. Um, so their top three findings were that the number of databases uh, directly correlated with the number of e-journals accessed by the students they studied. The second finding was that the number of databases accessed correlated with students' enrollment in their Intro 1 library instruction course. And their third main finding was that enrollment in their Intro 1 course and their Intro 2 library instruction course were correlated. So again, part of my question is, are we getting meaningful intelligence, meaningful information from all of this patron data collection? Or are some of these findings, and again, they're only correlational, they're not causative, are some of these findings things that we might arrive at um, through some, some common sense and maybe some other more qualitative data collection practices? 
So here's really where we are so far. Um, we're told that library value must be assessed using business metrics, like the return on investment, the ROI that was promoted by ACRL. We're being told that libraries must engage in indiscriminate and continuous data collection. Again, data collection perhaps without a specific purpose and that's ongoing, not just isolated to a specific initiative or a project. That libraries must collect identifiable patron data in the service of assessment and in, uh, to support our ability to partner or match our patron data to broader institutional data sets. We're told that patrons are well adjusted to behavioral data collection and profiling, and we're told that patron data collection does not implicate privacy. And so again, here's another little reference to Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland with the Mad Hatter saying, you're not the same as you were before, you were much more muchier, you've lost your muchness. And this is my way of saying a little tongue in cheek, I feel that libraries have lost their muchness. We've really abdicated some of our responsibility for patron privacy and confidentiality in this new movement uh, towards quantitative assessment. So before we unpack that any further, we're gonna jump in with another poll. So Michael should be launching that poll for you shortly. And I'm really just kind of curious which of the, these um, various practices are in place at your library. So we'll give you a second to weigh in on those. And all you have to do to participate in this poll is click any of those options on your screen right now and then just hit submit. I see that everybody is participating. We'll give you another, you know, 30 seconds to jump in and have your voice be heard. And yes, please go ahead and select the, the one option that best represents your institution. And I'm seeing that some are saying that uh, they need a none of the above option. <laughs> okay, last chance to jump in. I'm going to go ahead and close the poll right now. And let's take a look at some of these results. And we can see that the leading result is assessment and learning analytic using patron data. All right, so we're in the right place. <laughs> so here for me is the crux of the matter. And this was a very uncomfortable realization for me as I progressed through my study of learning analytics and its implication for the library. If you look at classic uh, definitions of surveillance and you see one on the right of your screen, Again, value neutral, apolitical, what we're talking about is monitoring and collecting data about a subject population or target population of influence, of interest, so that we can influence or supervise or regulate their activities. Here is another on the left side of your screen definition of learning analytics um, from EDUCAUSE from back in 2011, which is described as the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting about data, uh, I'm sorry, reporting of data about learners and their context for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning, so influencing learning, which is an embodied behavior of students, right, and the environments in which it occurs. So I have trouble looking at these definitions side by side and denying that learning analytics is in some cases, or is in all cases, right, is in its purpose, an implementation of surveillance. Right now, for me, that's a value neutral statement, except that I then look back at our profession and what our profession has said about surveillance and its implications for intellectual freedom and think, well, to what degree is it appropriate for me as a librarian to participate in learning analytics and other quantitatively driven institutional assessment um, activities. So if you're a more visual person, <laughs> as I am, um, here's 
another way of thinking about that, of looking at that literally. So the top dashboard on your screen is from Northwestern University. They have a big digital learning and learning analytics initiative. And you can see we're looking at a network map on the left. So this is an, a longitudinal map of people's interactions with each other and with certain components of their online course. In the center there is a content analysis. The size of that bubble indicates the number of times that uh, concept was discussed in their discussion threads and in their course. And on the right hand side we have some additional engagement data, not just network maps, but also um, uh, associating it then with letter grades up in the top of the screen. Now the bottom right is a network map from this blog post on the Free Future blog of uh, ACLU that was put up by Matthew Hardwood back in 2013 when we were just learning about the NSA's data collection practices and we were still having this metadata versus content debate. And the title of that post was My Life in Circles, Why Metadata is Incredibly Intimate. And what you're looking at is a snapshot in time of Matthew Harwood's Gmail, Google Mail contacts. Uh, the size of each node or bubble in that map is how many times he interacted with that individual, that contact. The color coding sorts panoptically or, or using data sorts his contacts into different subgroups, a work subgroup, a family subgroup, a, you know, a friends from college subgroup, and then shows how they're all connected. And what he points out in this, art, this blog post is that you look at this data over time, you can see fluctuations and changes and developments in his personal relationships just using his uh, Gmail uh, metadata. What's compelling to me looking at these network maps is then the network map at the bottom left. So this is a hand-drawn map which has been declassified from the um, East German secret police files. So when they had a person of interest, um, they would map out their social network, their behaviors, their affiliations with certain cultural institutions, including churches and schools. Um, and so when I look at these all together, I think, okay, this is at least the same practice that was put in place by, by an organization I think most of us would agree um, was engaging in surveillance of its population. And now we're seeing it popping up in our own intelligence uh, agencies in the United States and also now in education with learning analytics. So kind of an interesting and, and in my mind incontrovertible trend. So now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the impacts of that surveillance. So again, looking at surveillance from a value neutral, apolitical perspective, one of the things that we do know is that being observed or thinking that we might be observed changes our behavior. And the two studies that you see now on your screen, uh, one comes from the Berkeley Technology Law Journal and the other comes from Penn International, which represents writers, are really two demonstrations of that intellectual chilling effect of having our information behaviors monitored. Um, so we can see changes in internet searching and Wikipedia use before and after the revelations from Edward Snowden about the NSA back in 2013. And we also see writers self-disclosing that they've thought twice about writing about certain topics that they thought might subject them to surveillance. Um, so again, some documentation now coming from within our own discipline, the ALA's uh, privacy interpretation of the Library Bill of Rights says, when our users, our patrons recognize or even just fear that their privacy or confidence Confidentiality is compromised, true freedom of inquiry no longer exists. Um, and a little joke, you know, a little reference to Foucault there up in the top left corner. What the Foucault? I love this <laughs> version of WTF. Um, but again, a reference to uh, his work, um, Discipline and Punish the Birth of Prisons, which discussed Jeremy Bentham's panopticon and panopticism, this idea that you can internalize that feeling of being monitored, even if you're not actually being monitored, and then that then affects your behavior. Of course, one of the institutions that Michel Foucault looked at in that book was the school. The other thing that I want to point out apolitically about surveillance is that it has a disparate impact on people. Um, so this is a slide that I put together for a version of this talk at my own school where I was saying we know that surveillance has disparate impacts or different effects on different uh, populations. Those would include uh, what we would think of as minority populations. So people of color, religious minorities, our international students. There are some very major implications for student visas with respect to learning analytics and uh, attendance data. Any recipients of social services, and we can sort of include financial aid in that under that category. 
any borrowers with a high financial credit risk, and any students with a history of legal offenses. Um, so, and there's you know a slew of documentation there to sort of validate this explanation of the disparate impact of surveillance. So again, thinking of our own student populations, what we need to recognize is that we are not just taking on the risk of managing their data, so data as a liability, we are also exposing them to additional unknown risks by generating those data points. And I do want to say that in that three-part learning analytics series put together by ACRL, the second session dealt with ethics and learning analytics, and that's actually where I first heard of this concept of the district, disparate impact of surveillance. So I sort of wanted to plug that, you know, certainly there are ways in which our profession is aware of these issues and, and trying to move in the right direction, but I think we need to talk about this a little bit more. We're now going to dig a little bit more into um, some of these concepts about patron data. So on the left hand of your screen, you see another excerpt from Megan Oakleaf's Academic Library Value Impact Starter Kit, where she's saying we need to be able to know all these things about our patrons, at least in a, if not identifiable way, we need to know what patron did them. And until we know that, we'll be blocked in our efforts to demonstrate our value. So I want to unpack this in a couple of ways. Um, one is, again, this idea that metadata is not uh, completely unidentifiable or completely separated from who we are. So there's a very um, evocative article that you can find online called The Nature of Self in the Digital Age, where Alro Balkan says, Data about a thing, when you have enough of it, becomes the thing, and therefore data about you is you. So that's something that has really stayed with me as I think about learning analytics. Uh, the other sort of uh, person I want to bring into this conversation is Audre Lorde and her idea, um, her very famous address about the master's tools and their inability to dismantle the master's house, right? So I'm going to say something that's, again, uncomfortable. Um, and that I'm putting this forward as an idea, as a hypothesis that I haven't yet tested. So I'm interested to see if we get feedback from this. In my mind, if your parent institution is asking you for data to justify the continued existence of the library, that may be a battle that's already lost. Um, it's been my experience that our institutions, while they say they're practicing data-driven decision-making, more often practice decision-driven data-making. And I don't know that libraries will ever be able to make a satisfactory business-based case for our existence um, simply because we're not actually businesses and we are in the habit of collectivizing resources and then giving them away for free. <laughs> so it's really hard to make an ROI case for your continued existence um, when you're not necessarily following all of the rules of the road when it comes to running a business. So uh, Audre Lorde goes on to say in that same address, we need to celebrate our differences as strengths, which I will come back to. And we also need to think about developing our independent means of support. So one of the things that this might cause us to take another look at is developing uh, or strengthening our Friends of the Library Associations and achieving some financial independence from our parent institutions. Uh, the definition of privacy has really sort of bifurcated in recent times, and I think that we focus overly much on the data privacy end of things. So we assume that if we're collecting data, as long as we keep it secure, then we're, we're good to go. I want to um, bring back into the conversation this idea of autonomy privacy. And I first heard Siva Vedianathan articulate this idea in 2013 at the NASIG conference, although I think it pre-exists him certainly. Um, but the idea that privacy is the ability to control my reputation or what's known about me and who knows it. Um, it's also, again, the ability to be free from actual or potential observation. So autonomy privacy is where I hope libraries will begin to refocus their attention with respect to managing patron data. And I know I, I'm breaking every sort of uh, rule of the road when it comes to PowerPoint. These are very text-heavy slides. They'll be available for you to download after this session. So I'm just going to kind of talk over them. But this is essentially my, my citations or sort of my background uh, data for some of my claims. So one thing we do acknowledge in libraries is we need to collect some patron data to perform our library functions, right? So circulation, authentication to electronic resources are just two examples that come to mind. But when we collect patron data, we need to keep it in confidence. And protecting patron confidentiality 
underpins the trust relationship that we have with our patrons in order to do our jobs. And so I would also call to mind Kolthau's model of the information search process, right, from Carol Kolthau at Rutgers, where she's saying that information seeking is not just an intellectual journey, it's also an emotional journey, right, where our patrons experience frustration and come to us seeking help. Um, it's also in my mind an ontological journey where our patrons seek information to develop and refine their sense of the real world, as well as an epistemological journey where we participate in patrons' development of how they know what they know. And so it's our participation in some of those other intellectual and emotional processes that makes this a real sort of ethical conundrum for me. We also have some guidelines from the ALA about how we're supposed to handle patron data. And what they essentially say is users should have the right to be informed, users have the right to be in control, and we need to put in meaningful opt-in and opt-out mechanisms whenever we're going to collect patron data for reasons other than to perform the absolute necessary functions of the library. And finally, we have some guidelines as to how we should manage the sharing of patron data with third parties. We need to keep in mind that even de-identified or anonymized data can be re-identified. Um, so again, think back to Dana Boyd's technical properties of web data. They're sortable, they're searchable, they're partnerable. Um, we need to make sure that we've got agreements in place with third parties that stipulate our ongoing control of user data, that seek user consent to share their data, and that allow for that user data to be destroyed once it's no longer serving its purpose. And finally, we know that law enforcement has a vested interest in some of our patron data. So we need to make sure that our policies for sharing patron data with law enforcement agencies um, point back to making sure that there's a lawful court order for that data. When we started looking at learning analytics and how our discipline has been talking about learning analytics, I pointed to that um, Keeping Up With article from ACRL that was written by Dr. Stephen Bell, where he said that we might now see that our students are well adjusted to, to having their behavioral data collected and profiled. I think it's important that we remember that it's part of our role to not just steward and preserve intellectual freedom, but to teach the value of privacy to our students through our information literacy instruction. And that one of the outcomes that has been identified in the new framework for information literacy is this idea that information has value and that our students who are developing information literacy are able to make informed choices in full awareness of issues related to privacy and the commodification of their personal data. So again, it's on us to make sure that our patrons have this awareness and have an appreciation for the relationships between privacy, confidentiality, and intellectual freedom. So we've already visited sort of the content on the left hand of the slide here. And what I'm trying to remind us of, or, or the claim I'm trying to make here, is that libraries may not be successfully assessed using business metrics because we're not businesses. We operate on a social motive. That when we engage in indiscriminate and continuous data collection, we're actually participating in surveillance, which we have a long legacy of resisting. That we're saying that personally identifiable information should be minimized. Our collection of that data should be minimized to only uh, that which supports our functions. That educating patrons about their intellectual freedom and privacy is one of our core functions. And that collection always implicates not just data privacy, but also autonomy privacy in a much more fundamental way. So I'm going to try to zip through this conclusion so that we can get into the discussion here. But we're going to try to now sort of exercise our ethical imaginations about where we currently are in our quantitative assessment practices in academic libraries. So because I was having this gut sense that not all was right <laughs> with learning analytics and assessment, I, one of the first things I did was go back to our code of ethics. Um, and of these eight core principles, I think four really speak directly to the ethical tension that I at least am personally feeling. Number two is we uphold the principles of intellectual freedom. Number three addresses our responsibility for patrons' privacy and confidentiality. Uh, number, what is that, six, addresses this issue that we do not advance private interests at the expense of our users, right? So thinking back to that slide about 
how much capital, venture capital, is sloshing around in the learning analytics market. Again, we want to be mindful about that. And finally, uh, Megan Oafleaf had put forward this assertion that assessment is part of our professional ethic. And I don't necessarily disagree, except here in, in value point eight, we see that we're striving for excellence. Um, but the term that you never see there or, or in the preamble to our code of ethics is this idea of assessment. So we had some sense that we can achieve and strive for excellence without uh, continuous indiscriminate collection of patron data. So I'd like to sort of remind us that we're in the practice of facilitating but not monitoring access to information. And there are some additional ways that we can go about library assessment that maybe don't implicate patron data. One thing is that in my mind and in actually my training, assessment actually should be measuring, measuring our fulfillment of our mission, no less and no more. And if we think of our mission as being informed by our professional code of ethics and the ACRL's guidelines, standards, and frameworks, as well as that of our parent institutions, that means that activities like upholding intellectual freedom and protecting privacy and confidentiality are actually activities we should be assessing, not compromising in the interests of assessment. Um, so again, going back to some of the environmental ethics literature, I find it very compelling, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer's concept of the honorable harvest, and I think it's applicable to uh, performing an honorable data harvest, the idea that we should be accountable, we should ask for permission and abide by the answer, we should take only what is given and only what we need. We should be minimizing harm, using everything we take, and then sustaining the ones who are sustaining us, right? So really preserving the sanctity of our relationships with our patrons and those conditions of confidentiality and privacy in order to perform our core function of helping them connect with the information that we need. We accomplish this uh, logistically by performing privacy audits, developing data governance plans, deriving from those governance plans, privacy policies, and proper system configuration, taking into account frameworks like privacy by, by design, and making sure that we implement meaningful opt-in and opt-out measures when it comes to patron data collection. A privacy audit is very simply gathering information about how data flows through your organization and who has access to it. And what's really interesting about the Impact Starter Kit from Megan Oakleaf is that she has a beautiful template for a privacy audit built right in. So it's activity number 12 in that workbook. She calls it the library data audit. And as part of that activity, she says, the data we collect represents what we value about ourselves, which I completely agree. And I would extend that quote to say, the way in which we collect that data also represents what we value. And that's part of the claim that I'm putting forward today. From the results of a privacy audit, you can start to develop a data governance policy. There's really great resources through ALA to do this, um, through their privacy toolkit. But the data governance policy is an internal doc document that describes who, what, when, where, why, and how you're cl uh, collecting data, including managing that data, destroying that data when it's no longer useful, and what your breach response or uh, data security plan will be if that data is ever compromised. From that data governance policy, you develop a privacy policy, which is essentially the patron-facing data governance policy. And these are the sections of a privacy policy that ALA recommends. A couple that I want to just highlight here under emerging technologies, they have language that says it's important for us not to take on the attitude that patrons no longer care about privacy, right? And if you'll recall from the ACRL framework learning outcome that we looked at, it's actually our responsibility to make sure that they do care. Finally, once you've conducted your privacy audit, developed your data governance plan and your uh, privacy plan, privacy policy, you can then think about your system configuration. How are you putting this all into practice? And the framework that I recommend for thinking about system and process configuration is called privacy by design. You see the seven fundamental principles of privacy by design up there on your screen. This is actually um, from Canada, from Anne Kavukian, who was at one time Ontario's uh, information and privacy officer. 
And the idea here is that it's really not a zero-sum game between maintaining privacy and gathering the uh, personally identifiable data that we need to conduct our business. The idea is that we can have a positive sum outcome by being privacy-minded from the outset, putting our users in control, and maintaining some transparency over the data that we collect, how we use it, when and whether and how we ever destroy it, and who we share it with. And again, I think that all seven of these principles are really nicely consistent with the guidance that we're getting from our own professional organizations. I'd also like to point out that we don't have to just collect the low-hanging fruit clickstream data from our patrons. We've got some additional existing data sources, including de-identified or anonymized transactional data, our student engagement surveys, um, the national uh, student satisfaction and engagement survey and the community college version, libqols and other similar library specific surveys, graduate exit surveys, and possibly, and I know this is controversial, but even aggregated evaluation data of library staff and li librarians and library faculty. We should also be going after sort of the hard to reach fruit, which is the qualitative data. And again, um, while we differ on some things, I think that Megan Oakleaf gives us some great ideas for qualitative data collection uh, approaches in the Impact Starter Kit. We can also gather testimonials, run focus groups, uh, have advisory committees, take a look at how we're responding to things in our suggestion boxes, and even conduct self-studies. So before we close out, I want to somewhat selfishly ask whether this presentation gave you something to think about, and then I'll present some uh, final closing remarks and we'll open it up for discussion in the time that we have left. So as you can see on your screen, you now have a poll asking you, did this presentation give you something to think about? If you want to just select yes or no and hit submit, that'd be great. I'll give you just about another 10 or 15 seconds to jump in. I could see uh, almost everybody has participated in our poll today. And so I'm going to go ahead and just another five or so seconds before we close it out. I'm going to go ahead and close out our poll. And as we can see, there's a pretty unanimous yes there. All right. Well, thanks Thanks for at least playing along. Um, you may have been wondering where the title for the presentation comes from, and it actually comes from the preamble of our Code of Ethics, which says, and I'll just read it in full, in a political system grounded in an informed citizenry, we are members of a profession explicitly committed to intellectual freedom and the freedom of access to information. We have a special obligation to ensure the free flow of information and ideas to present and future generations. Um, so thanks for your indulgence. I took a little more time to get through that than I hoped because I really want to open up for conversation and discussion. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael now, who will be uh, my Moderating that through the Q&A chat. I'm interested to hear what folks think. So if you have some questions for Sarah, feel free to post them in the questions chat and I'll read them out so everybody knows what we're addressing and have Sarah address those questions. So I'll give you about a couple of moments to go ahead and think about your question and put it right into the chat box there, that questions chat box. Uh, I can't believe we don't have any questions from our audience today. So we do. Uh, here's the question. I think a lot of librarians obsess with assessment uh, has to do with providing the information, uh, pro proving that information literacy has value. I've always held that the value of information literacy sessions or library workshops can only be assessed in the context of academic departments. So, Sarah, what do you think about that? That's fascinating because I think what that comment brings to play is that, you know, who, really it's the question, who's the primary audience for this assessment data? 
And I would tend to agree with you that one of the audiences that we take for granted is the people that I refer to as the subject faculty, right? So as a library and faculty, um, I don't, uh, they're the sort of subject matter experts, right, who bring us into their classes uh, to talk to them about the information literacy skills uh, to apply to research within that discipline. Um, one of the approaches, the qualitative approaches that we took to assessment of information literacy was to actually look at student artifacts produced as a result or, or after having attended an information literacy session or a workshop, but in the context of application within a course or within a, a given subject discipline. Um, so I agree with you that I think we cannot separate assessment of information literacy skills with their actual application. And I personally have questioned the usefulness of uh, sort of pre and post IL session assessment data or um, data looking only at, you know, attendance at an IL session and then matching that with that individual student's success on a given assignment in a given course or their GPA. Um, so I think I agree with you that the obsession comes from this concern about communicating our value and that for whatever reason we've capitulated to the idea that we need to communicate the value by making a business case, by assigning almost a financial or monetary value or, or um, measures that derive from financial value like the ROI to what we do. So I think in my mind I agree that there's this fundamental mis uh, mismatch between what we're actually assessing and how we're actually assessing it. There's also a fundamental mismatch between what we're assessing and why we're assessing it. And I think we need to go back to recognizing that assessment should be about our fulfillment of our mission and that we need to use methods of assessment that not just accurately reflect our work towards our mission, our achievement of our goals, but that also don't compromise on our, our mission and our achievement uh, of our goals through our work. And in my mind, um, some of these quantitative methods of library assessment have actually resulted in a, a very significant value, cultural value shift away from ideas of privacy, confidentiality, and intellectual freedom towards uh, a very quantitatively driven assessment culture, which then drives how we teach, right? Um, how we engage with our patrons in reference consultations, um, because it's now become opportunities for data capture as opposed to opportunities for building our patrons' information literacy skills. So I'm not sure if that answers your question. It's a very interesting comment, and I would tend to agree with your premise that we need to take into account the audiences for this data also. And again, what you're getting at is the easy to reach low hanging fruit, which is the clickstream data, the transactional data, versus the hard to reach fruit, which is really going back to our colleagues and our liaison areas and say, can you help us develop a meaningful information literacy assessment strategy that um, takes into account how your students need to apply to our learning outcomes to research in your discipline. Great, and so I, I see uh, some threads building in, in the uh, questions here, and uh, there was a comment about the importance that assessment staff at institutions understand our special obligation, and then there was a uh, question that builds on that, how do we communicate these concerns to library and university administrators who are asking us to expand our data capture and run the numbers? And therein lies the rub. <laughs> so. First in my mind, and, and this goes back to my invocation of Audre Lorde's uh, master's tool speech, we need to recognize that um, we need to be comfortable and maybe build, maybe that, that comes down to building some financial independence from our parent institutions if all of our budget allocation is going to be driven by student assessment data, which is certainly absolutely the, the, the direction that things are heading in. I also think we need to have some really frank and honest conversations with our administrators to say, you know, quite honestly, what you're asking us to produce is in direct violation with what we exist to do, uh, is really 
I've become very sort of privacy radical through these two years I've been looking at learning analytics, but really that's what it comes down to for me. I cannot fulfill my professional responsibilities and obligations as a librarian and also indiscriminately collect patron data. They are antithetical to each other. Um, and I've made some strides in having that conversation with some administrators at my own campus. Uh, Michael's laughing at me, but <laughs> some strides. Um, so a little bit of it comes down to messaging. And some of it will also come down to our own creativity. We need to give them alternatives. So I don't like to uh, raise problems without also suggesting some solutions. And I know I uh, blew kind of quickly through those at the end of the session today. But I think there are alternatives for us to consider. Um, that's using our anonymized and de-identified data. That's using some qualitative data that's very um, sort of above board in how it's collected as opposed to what I view as the surreptitious collection of our students and patrons clickstream data. Um, and that's to say that we can tell a story about the library's role in the institution, but it needs to be true to our role and it needs to be a story that we're comfortable telling. And our telling that story can't compromise on the plot of the story, right? It can't compromise on our ability to fulfill our role at the institution. So it's going to take some guts. And it's going to absolutely potentially result in even further loss of resources if the only way we have access to those resources is to compromise our patrons' privacy and confidentiality, which is really where we are. Um, so I think building uh, some independence and also, you know, financial independence from our parent institutions and also as professionals going back and revisiting maybe the ECFIS course that you taught in your library science program or revisiting some of the ethics and privacy guidelines that are provided by the ALA and presenting those to our administrators and saying, you know, th this is my what I've been invoking is it's my academic freedom to comport myself as a librarian and as a subject matter expert in this field in a way that doesn't implicate patron data without their knowledge and consent. And, you know, the, I am somewhat protected with faculty status and hopefully eventually with tenure if I can behave myself. <laughs> and, and even with, um, you know, some collective bargaining protection. And I'm still scared to put some of these ideas out there. But I think that's what it's going to take is some real, you know, moral courage to say, you're asking me to um, compromise in some areas that I really don't feel professionally I can compromise in. And I'm not going to advance private interest, even my own self-interest, before the rights of my student patrons and my faculty patrons to privacy and confidentiality and full awareness of how their data is collected and used. So there's no um, magic bullet. <laughs> it's an uncomfortable um, position that we find ourselves in. And I think part of it will be garnering the resources, as I tried to do today, to really demonstrate that I'm not just making this up. This is the professional legacy of the discipline that I participate in. And you're asking me to do something in ways that I don't think uh, passes muster with the guidance from my discipline. So here are some alternatives that I have to offer, or here are the systems for informing our patrons of the data collection and providing them an opt-in or opt-out mechanism and uh, for maintaining full transparency in our use of their data. A really great model for this, which is just coming out, is from UC Berkeley, where they've engaged in a multi-year initiative to develop new student data and privacy policies, as well as transparency reporting. So I encourage folks to go out and look at the uh, UC Berkeley ethics page on privacy, because it lays all of this out. They were also recently written up by, I believe it was Educause Review, um, and that's where those definitions for data privacy versus autonomy privacy actually came from. But yeah, I, I feel your pain, trust me. It is a very difficult conversation to have. It implicates our lifeline of resources, which is why one of the things I think we need to think about is uh, you know, developing endowments, developing some financial independence so that we have the freedom we need to have to operate in full transparency and ethical compliance with the use of patron data. Great, just to be considerate of everybody's time, I'm going to try to bundle this last question, pulling from a number of comments and questions that have come in. Um, many of them are talking about uh, how can libraries push back against, or, uh, against this data collection, this decision-driven data making. 
uh, and, and kind of put that together with this idea that, and I can speak um, from experience with Sarah here, that um, there's a question here about these tech companies that um, have an interest in, in the younger generation losing privacy standards so that they can collect and sell their data and make a ton of money off them. Um, and this comes back to this idea of using analytics on campus, uh, using LMSs uh, and other tools, say like Starfish, these early alert systems. So if you could speak a little bit about this, this third party issue and then how can we possibly push back against this, you know, uh, decisions already made by data and just just being um, you know this decision driven data making uh, it's a really great question <laughs> um, so again it's going to come back to um, you're identifying the risk and the risk is different for all of us and I, I went over some of the ways in which I feel that I can step out on this limb because I have certain protections that I recognize that not all of my academic library and colleagues have. Um, so some of the things that have uh, felt effective for me in, in the short term is you will have colleagues uh, in the discipline, so those disciplinary or subject matter expert faculty who are natural allies um, in this conversation, who, um, as I did two years ago, felt in their gut that, you know, there was maybe something a little rotten in Denmark, but we've frankly lost the ability to discuss these issues. So if you bring up privacy as an example, the entire conversation is going to focus on data privacy. So one of the things that I've done is try to, at my institution, direct the conversation to an acknowledgement of autonomy privacy, that in the simple act of collecting data, we are affecting our students. Um, and in uh, the simple act of their awareness that we are collecting clickstream data from the LMS or uh, using early alert systems like Starfish to kind of monitor and track their progress. That that very knowledge and awareness alters their behavior as they progress through through their programs of study. So use research, right? And I, I will give a, another shameless plug here. I'm uh, maintaining what I call a living annotated bibliography about learning analytics in a library guide. So I'll ask Michael to pop that URL into the chat box. It's at libguides.dccc.edu slash learning underscore analytics. Um, so you can use the research that's coming out about learning analytics and the ethical conundra inherent in learning analytics and quantitatively driven assessment to really engage your institution in this conversation. Um, I also think that librarians need to be at the forefront of developing institutional privacy policies and institutional data governance policies. Um, in many cases, those don't yet exist in higher education, or maybe there's a very, you know, a privacy policy tied to network usage, but not now taking into account learning management system data. Um, and I think librarians have a very natural, disciplinary, professional, vested role in initiating and leading the conversation about privacy on campus. And again, um, I've sort of joked with, with students and my colleagues, you need to let your freak flag fly a little bit. You need to kind of come out as someone who cares about privacy and cares about confidentiality and cares about ethical use of student data in order to then find out who your allies are and who, who's kind of clued into that conversation. Um, let's see. And so then getting back to this idea of the decision driven data making, I'm holding out some hope that this is a cyclical cultural phenomena that we will see recede in coming years because some of the data that we're getting out of the studies of learning analytics are really, you know, um, there was just a, a study posted to Educause Review that Michael and I have been looking at where their main takeaway looking at every Blackboard Learning version 9.1 installation in North America, the, their main finding was that student access to an online gradebook correlates with better student grades. So it gets down to this point where we're looking at these findings and saying, look folks, you know, is this a breakthrough discovery or are a lot of the, you know, findings that we're getting back from learning analytic studies really telling us things we already know? Um, I'll give you another example. So we're a Starfish institution at DCCC, which is an early alert and student tracking software. 
there was just a study put forward by the CCRC, the Community College Research Center up at Columbia. They've been looking at um, technology-mediated student advising uh, with systems like Starfish. And their main finding is that the technology is best and most effective at facilitating or supporting face-to-face -face interactions. Again, did we need to implicate student data and, in my mind, violate student privacy and confidentiality to arrive at that conclusion? So one of the things we need to engage in, and this is actually, um, I'll borrow a phrase from Dr. John Sullivan at Muhlenberg, we need to engage in some critical scholarship. So he was referencing back in 2013 in his article, The Data Panopticon. And I'm sort of here saying the data panopticon has arrived at our campuses. And as librarians with a vested professional interest in privacy and confidentiality, we need to start spearheading a conversation that points this out and questions the legitimacy and the validity of this approach to assessment and uh, the use of learning analytics and really like, you know, ask the question, what are we getting out of this? Um, who is really benefiting? Because you'll find that uh, at least in my sort of analysis and reading, students tend to be at the bottom of the list. So institutions are using this data for purposes of accreditation and reporting with, you know, the voluntary accountability framework, for instance. They're using this data to produce uh, grant proposals. They're using this data to um, uh, assign resources and schedule courses in a strategic way based on what they know about students' behavior and progress through different uh, programs of study. But when it comes down to what are we finding that's going to fundamentally change our approach to teaching to fundamentally improve the experience of learning, there's not a lot of there there. So I'm kind of, you know, when I talk to colleagues and administrators about this, I'm saying like, where's the beef? Because everything I'm reading about learning analytics is, is frankly not that compelling and really doesn't satisfy my question of is it worth sacrificing our students privacy and confidentiality to arrive at these findings so you know one of those tests of the common rule right when you do research with human subjects is is there going to be uh, some potential measurable benefit to your subject population in my mind the jury's still out with learning analytics uh, one other thing that i'll put forward here and i believe this was in an educause review or another educause uh, publication you'll you'll definitely find it listed at that lib guide is that they're actually saying that adoption and implementation of learning analytics systems is in decline and one of the issues that they cite is a quote culture of a potential culture of faculty resistance so i'll take a little credit for that but also i just don't think that they're they're seeing that our institutions are seeing a return on investment for the expenditure that it takes both financially as well as in staffing resources as well as even with reputation cost uh, to implement these systems so i think if you can question some of the premises if you can question uh, some of the the validity of some of the approaches and the data capture if you can raise questions about privacy policies data retention and governance policies students abilities to opt in and opt out and if you can also raise questions about the ultimate findings you know what are we really getting out of this um, that's what's been powerful for me at least and when you phrase those things in a question that's when people will start to approach you and say hey you know I have that in mind or I didn't know how to articulate that or I'm so glad that you asked that um, and you will start to open up organically this conversation about you know what is it that we're really doing and what is it that we really expect to get out of it I want to thank Sarah for this excellent, thought-provoking presentation. A recording of this presentation will be made available through TCLC's YouTube channel in the near future. Once it's available, we'll let you know, and all TCLC members know through the TCLC listserv. As we conclude now, I want to encourage you to complete the webinar evaluation that will appear on your screen shortly. Again, I want to thank you for joining us, and I want to thank Sarah for an excellent presentation of our special obligation, Library Assessment Learning Analytics and intellectual freedom and look for our next webinar the digital liberal arts thursday may 4th 2017 2 p.m to 3 p.m once again thank you sarah and thank you for joining us today for this webinar